Book One, Chapter One of the Lancashire Witches. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Reading by Andy Minter. The Lancashire Witches, A Romance of Pendle Forest, by William Harrison Ainsworth. Book One, Alison Device, Chapter One, The May Queen. On a May day in the early part of the seventeenth century, and a most lovely May day too, admirably adapted to usher in the merriest month of the year, and seemingly made expressly for the occasion, a wake was held at Whaley, to which all the neighbouring country folk resorted, and indeed many of the gentry as well, for in the good old times, when England was still merry England, a wake had attractions for all classes alike, and especially in Lancashire, for— with pride I speak it, there were no lads who, in running, vaulting, wrestling, dancing, or in any other manly exercise, could compare with the Lancashire lads. In archery, above all, none could match them, for were not their ancestors the stout bowmen and billmen whose cloth-yard shafts and trenchant weapons won the day at Flodden? And were they not true sons of their fathers? And then I speak it with yet greater pride— there were few, if any, lasses who could compare in comeliness with the rosy-cheeked, dark-haired, bright-eyed lasses of Lancashire. Assemblages of this kind, therefore, where the best specimens of either sex were to be met with, were sure to be well attended, and in spite of an enactment passed in the preceding reign of Elizabeth, prohibiting piping, playing, bear-baiting, and bull-baiting on the Sabbath days, or on any other days, and also superstitious ringing of bells, wakes, and other common feasts, they were not only not interfered with, but rather encouraged by the higher orders. Indeed, it was well known that the reigning monarch, James I, inclined the other way, and desirous of checking the growing spirit of Puritanism throughout the kingdom, had openly expressed himself in favour of honest recreation after evening prayers and upon holidays, and furthermore had declared that he liked well the spirit of his good subjects in Lancashire, and would not see them punished for indulging in lawful exercises, but that ere long he would pay them a visit in one of his progresses, and judge for himself, and would grant them still further licence. Meanwhile this expression of the royal opinion removed every restriction, and old dances with rush-bearings, bell-ringings, wakes, and feasts, were as much practised as before the passing of the obnoxious enactment of Elizabeth. The Puritans and Precisians discountenanced them, it is true, as much as ever, and would have put them down, if they could, as savouring of papistry and idolatry, and some rigid divines thundered against them from the pulpit. But with the King and the authorities in their favour, the people little heeded these denunciations against them, and abstained not from any honest recreation whenever a holiday occurred. If Lancashire were famous for wakes, the wakes of Whaley were famous even in Lancashire. The men of the district were in general a hardy, handsome race, of the genuine Saxon breed, and passionately fond of all kinds of pastimes, and the women had their full share of the beauty indigenous to the soil. Besides, it was a secluded spot in the height of a wild mountainous region, than though occasionally visited by travellers journeying northward, or by others coming from the opposite direction, retained a primitive simplicity of manners, and a great partiality for old customs and habits. The natural beauties of the place, contrasted with the dreary region around it, and heightened by the picturesque ruins of the ancient abbey, part of which, namely the old abbot's lodgings, had been converted into a residence by the Ashertons, and was now occupied by Sir Ralph Asherton, while the other was left to the ravages of time, made it always an object of attraction to those residing near it. But when, on the May day in question, there was not only to be a wake, but a maypole set on the green, and a rush bearing with Morris dancers besides, together with wits and ale at the abbey, Crowds flocked to Whaley from Wisdall, Coldcoats, and Clitheroe, from Ribchester and Blackburn, from Padiham and Pendle, and even from places more remote. Not only was John Laws of the Dragon full, but the Chequers and the Swan also, and the roadside alehouse to boot. Sir Ralph Asherton had several guests at the Abbey, and others were expected in the course of the day, while Dr. Ormerod had friends staying with him at the vicarage. Soon after midnight on the morning of the festival, many young persons of the village, of both sexes, had arisen, 
and to the sound of horn had repaired to the neighbouring woods, and there gathered a vast stock of green boughs and flowering branches of the sweetly perfumed hawthorn, wild roses, and honeysuckle, with baskets of violets, cowslips, primroses, bluebells, and other wild flowers, and returning in the same order they went forth, fashioned the branches into green bowers within the churchyard, all round about the maypole set up on the green, and decorated them afterwards with garlands and crowns of flowers. This morning ceremonial ought to have been performed without wetting the feet, but though some pains were taken in the matter, few could achieve the difficult task, except those carried over the dewy grass by their lusty swains. On the day before the rushes had been gathered, and the rush-cart piled, shaped and trimmed, and adorned by those experienced in the task, and it was one requiring both taste and skill as will be seen when the cart itself shall come forth, while others had borrowed for its adornment, from the abbey and elsewhere, silver tankards, drinking-cups, spoons, ladles, brooches, watches, chains, and bracelets, so as to make an imposing show. Day was ushered in by a merry peal of bells from the tower of the old parish church, and the ringers practised all kinds of joyous changes during the morning, and fired many a clanging volley. The whole village was early astir, and as these were times when good hours were kept, and as early rising is a famous sharpener of the appetite, especially when attended with exercise, so an hour before noon the rustics one and all sat down to dinner, the strangers being entertained by their friends, and if they had no friends, throwing themselves upon the general hospitality. The alehouses were reserved for tippling at a later hour, for it was then customary for both gentlemen and commoner, male as well as female, as will be more fully shown hereafter, to take their meals at home, and repair afterwards to houses of public entertainment for wine or other liquors. Private chambers were, of course, reserved for the gentry, but not unfrequently the squire and his friends would take their bottle with the other guests. Such was the invariable practice in the northern counties in the reign of James I. Soon after midday, and when the bells began to peal merrily again, for even ringers must recruit themselves, at a small cottage in the outskirts of the village, and close to the calder, whose waters swept past the trimly kept garden attached to it, two young girls were employed in attiring a third, who was to represent Maid Marian, or Queen of the May, in the pageant there about to ensue. And certainly by sovereign and prescriptive right of beauty, no one better deserved the high title and distinction conferred upon her than this fair girl. Lovelier maiden in the whole county, and however high her degree than this rustic damsel, it was impossible to find. And though the becoming and fanciful costume in which she was decked could not heighten her natural charms, it certainly displayed them to advantage. Upon her smooth and beautiful brow sat a gilt crown, while her dark and luxuriant hair, covered behind with a scarlet coif embroidered with gold, and tied with yellow, white, and crimson ribbons, but otherwise wholly unconfined, swept down almost to the ground. Slight and fragile, her figure was of such just proportion that every movement and gesture had an indescribable charm. The most courtly dame might have envied her fine and taper fingers, and fancied she could improve these by protecting them against the sun, or by rendering them snowy white with paste or cosmetic. But this was questionable. Nothing certainly could improve the small foot and finely turned ankle, so well displayed in the red hose and smart little yellow buskin fringed with gold. A stomacher of scarlet cloth, braided with yellow lace in crossbars, confined her slender waist. Her robe was of carnation-coloured silk, with wide sleeves, and the gold-fringed skirt descended only a little below the knee, like the dress of a modern Swiss peasant, so as to reveal the exquisite symmetry of her limbs. Over all she wore a surcoat of azure silk, lined with white and edged with gold. In her left hand she held a red pink as an emblem of the season. So enchanting was her appearance altogether, so fresh the character of her beauty, so bright the bloom that dyed her lovely cheeks, that she might have been taken for a personification of May herself. She was, indeed, in the very May of life, the mingling of spring and summer in womanhood, and the tender blue eyes, bright and clear as diamonds of purest water, the soft, regular features, and the merry mouth, whose ruddy, parted lips ever and anon displayed two rows of pearls, completed the similitude to the attributes of the jocund month. 
her handmaidens, both of whom were simple girls, and though not destitute of some pretensions to beauty themselves, in no wise to be compared with her, were at the moment employed in knotting the ribbons in her hair, and adjusting the azure surcoat. Attentively watching these proceedings, sat on a stool placed in a corner, a little girl, some nine or ten years old, with a basket of flowers on her knee. The child was very diminutive, even for her age, and her smallness was increased by personal deformity, occasioned by contraction of the chest and spinal curvature, which raised her back above her shoulders. But her features were sharp and cunning, almost malignant, and there was a singular and unpleasant look about the eyes, which were not placed evenly in the head. Altogether she had a strange old-fashioned look, and from her habitual bitterness of speech, as well as from her vindictive character, which, young as she was, had been displayed with some effect on more than one occasion, she was no great favourite with any one. It was curious now to watch the eager and envious interest she took in the progress of her sister's adornment, for such was the degree of relationship in which she stood to the May Queen, and when the surcoat was finally adjusted, and the last ribbon tied, she broke forth— having hitherto preserved a sullen silence. "'Well, Sister Alison, ye may a farrently may queen, I maun say,' she observed spitefully. "'But to my mind, neither Sulky Worsley or Nancy Orp here would have looked prettier.' Eh, no, that we shouldna,' rejoined one of the damsels referred to. "'There's no lass in Lancashire to hold a condle near Alison device.' "'Fie upon you for an ill-favoured minx, Janet,' cried Nancy Holt. "'You're jealous of your pretty sister.' "'Ah, jealous!' cried Janet, reddening. "'Why the Philip should I be jealous, eh, you saucy jade? "'When I grow older, I'll make a prettier May Queen than any of you, "'and so the lads are tell me.' "'And so you will, Janet,' said Alison Device, "'checking by a gentle look the jeering laugh "'in which Nancy had seemed disposed to indulge. "'So you will, my pretty little sister,' she added, kissing her. "'and I will tie you as well and as carefully as Susan and Nancy have just attired me.' "'Mayhap I shanna live till then,' rejoined Janet peevishly. "'And when I'm dead and gone and laid into the cold churchyard, "'you and they will be sorry for having wedded me so.' "'I have never intentionally vexed you, Janet, love,' said Alison, "'and I'm sure these two girls love you dearly.' "'Aye, we make allowances for our few tempers,' observed Susan Worsley. "'for we know that ailments and deformities are sure to make for fretful.' "'Ah, there it is!' cried Janet sharply. "'My high shoulders and my small sails are always thrown in my face. "'But I grow tall in time and get straight. "'Ah, straighter than you, Suki, with your broad back and short neck. "'But if I don't know what matters it, I shall be feared at any rate. "'Ah, feared winches by you both.' Oh, "'No doubt on it, though, little good-for-nothing piece of mischief.' muttered Susan. "'What's that you say, Suki?' cried Janet, whose quick ears had caught the words. "'Take care what you do to offend me, lass,' she added, shaking her thin fingers, armed with talon-like claws threateningly at her. "'Or oh, I'll ask my granddam, Mother Demdike, to quieten you.' At the mention of this name a sudden shade came over Susan's countenance. Changing colour and slightly trembling, she turned away from the child who, noticing the effect of her threat, could not repress her triumph. But again Alison interposed. "'Do not be alarmed, Susan,' she said. "'My grandmother will never harm you, I am sure. Indeed, she will never harm any one. And do not heed what little Janet says, for she is not aware of the effect of her own words, or of the injury they might do to our grandmother if repeated.' "'I do not wish to repeat them, or to think of them,' <laughs> sobbed Susan. "'That's good, that's kind of you, Susan,' replied Alison, taking her hand. "'Do not be cross any more, Janet. You see, you have made her weep.' "'I'm glad on it,' rejoined the little girl, laughing. "'Let her cry on. It'll do her good, and teach her to mend her manners, and nay offend me again.' "'I didn't mean to offend you, Janet,' sobbed Susan. "'But you're so ridden and marred, a body cannot speak to please you.' "'Well, if you confess your fault, I'm satisfied.' said the little girl. "'But well, let it be a lesson to you, Suki, to keep guard of your tongue in future.' "'It shall, I, I promise you,' replied Susan, drying her eyes. At this moment a door opened, and a woman entered from an inner room, 
having a high-crowned, conical-shaped hat on her head, and broad white pinners over her cheeks. Her dress was of dark red camlet, with high-heeled shoes. She stooped slightly, and being rather lame, supported herself on a crutch-handled stick. In age she might be between forty and fifty, but she looked much older, and her features were not at all prepossessing, from a hooked nose and chin, while their sinister effect was increased by a formation of the eyes similar to that in Janet, only more strongly noticeable in her case. This woman was Elizabeth Device, widow of John Device, about whose death there was a mystery to be inquired into hereafter, and mother of Alison and Janet, though how she came to have a daughter so unlike herself in all respects as the former, no one could conceive. But so it was. "'So you had donned your finery at last, Alison,' said Elizabeth. "'Your brother Jem has just run up to say that Rushcart has set out, and that Robin Hood and his merry men are coming for their queen, and their queen is quite ready for them,' replied Alison, moving towards the door. "'Nay, let's have a look at you first, wench,' cried Elizabeth, staying her. "'Fine fiddlers make fine birds. I warrant me now you'll get in these make you goes on. You fancy yourself a queen in earnest.' "'A queen of a day, mother, a queen of a little village festival. Nothing more,' replied Alison. "'Oh, if I were a queen in right earnest, or even a great lady—' "'What would you do?' demanded Elizabeth Device sourly. "'I'd make you rich, mother, and build you a grand house to live in. Much grander than Brown's home, or Downham, or Middleton.' Oh, "'Pity you're near a queen, then, Alison,' replied Elizabeth relaxing her harsh features into a wintry smile. "'What would you do for me, Alison, if you're a queen?' asked little Jennet, looking up at her. "'Why, let me see. I'd indulge every one of your whims and wishes. You should only need ask to have.' Oh, oh, "'You'd never content her,' observed Elizabeth testily. "'It's no your way to try and content me, mother, even when you might,' rejoined Jennet who, if she loved few people, loved her mother least of all, and never lost an opportunity of testifying her dislike to her. "'Oh, a ponty little wasp!' cried her mother. "'Thou deserve nought but what thou dost not get often enough, a good whipping.' "'You ye hanna told us what you'd do for yourself if you were a great lady, Alison,' interposed Susan. "'Oh, I hadn't thought about myself,' replied the other, laughing. "'I can tell you what she'd do, Sukey.' replied little Janet knowingly. She'd marry Master Richard Asherton of Middleton. Janet! exclaimed Alison, blushing crimson. It's true, replied the little girl. You know you would, Alison. Look at her face, she added with a screaming laugh. Hold your tongue, little plague, cried Elizabeth, rapping her knuckles with her stick, and behave thyself, or thou shanna go out at wake. Janet dealt her mother a bitterly vindictive look, but she neither uttered cry nor made remark. In the momentary silence that ensued, the blithe jingling of bells was heard, accompanied by the merry sound of tabor and pipe. "'Ah, oh, here come the rush-cart and the Morris dancers!' cried Alison, rushing joyously to the window, which, being left partly opened, admitted the scent of the woodbine and eglantine, by which it was overgrown, as well as the humming sound of the bees by which the flowers were invaded." Almost immediately afterwards a frolic troop, like a band of maskers, approached the cottage, and drawing up before it, while the jingling of bells ceasing at the same moment, told that the rush-cart had stopped likewise. Chief among the party was Robin Hood, clad in a suit of Lincoln green, with a sheaf of arrows at his back, a bugle dangling from his baldric, a bow in his hand, and a broad-leaved green hat on his head, looped up on one side, and decorated with a heron's feather. The hero of Sherwood was personated by a tall, well-limbed fellow, to whom, being really a forester of Boland, the character was natural. Beside him stood a very different figure, a jovial friar, with shaven crown, rubicund cheeks, bull-throat, and a mighty paunch, covered by a russet habit, and girded in by a red cord, decorated with golden twist and tassel. He wore red hose and sandal shoes, and carried in his girdle a wallet, to contain a roast capon, a neat's tongue, or any other dainty given him. Friar Tuck, for such he was, found his representative in Ned Huddleston, porter at the Abbey, who, as the largest and stoutest man in the village, was chosen on that account to the part. 
Next to him came a character of no little importance, and upon whom much of the mirth of the pageant depended, and this devolved upon the village cobbler, Jack Roby, a dapper little fellow, who fitted the part of the fool to a nicety. With bauble in hand, and blue coxcomb hood adorned with long white ass's ears upon his head, with jerkin of green, striped with yellow, hose of different colours, the left leg being yellow with a red pantoufle, and the right blue terminated with the yellow shoe, with bells hung upon various parts of his motley attire, so that he could not move without producing a jingling sound. Jack Roby looked wonderful indeed, and was constantly dancing about and dealing a blow with his bauble. Next came Will Scarlet, Stukely, and Little John, all proper men and tall, attired in Lincoln green like Robin Hood, and similarly equipped. Like him, too, they were all foresters of Bowland, owing service to the bow-bearer, Mr. Parker, of Browsholme Hall, and the representative of Little John, who was six feet and a half high and stout in proportion, was Lawrence Blackrod, Mr. Parker's head-keeper. After the foresters came Tom the Piper, a wandering minstrel, habited for the occasion in a blue doublet, with sleeves of the same colour turned up with yellow, red hose and brown buskins, red bonnet and green surcoat lined with yellow. Beside the piper was another minstrel, similarly attired, and provided with a tabor. Lastly came one of the main features of the pageant, and which, together with the fool, contributed most materially to the amusement of the spectators. This was the hobby-horse. The hue of this spirited charger was a pinkish-white, and his housings were of crimson cloth hanging to the ground, so as to conceal the rider's real legs, though a pair of sham ones dangled at the side. His bit was of gold, and his bridle red morocco leather, while his rider was sumptuously arrayed in a purple mantle bordered with gold, with a rich cap of the same regal hue on his head, encircled with gold, and having a red feather stuck in it. The hobby-horse had a plume of nodding feathers on his head, and careered from side to side, now rearing in front, now kicking behind, now prancing, now gently ambling, and, in short, indulging in playful fancies and vagaries, such as horse never indulged in before, to the imminent danger, it seemed, of his rider, and to the huge delight of the beholders. Nor must it be admitted, as it was a matter of great wonderment to the lookers-on, that by some legerdemain contrivance the rider of the hobby-horse had a couple of daggers stuck in his cheeks, while from his steed's bridle hung a silver ladle, which he held now and then to the crowd, and in which, when he did so, a few coins were sure to rattle. After the hobby-horse came the maypole, not the tall pole, so called, and which was already planted in the green, but a stout staff, elevated some six feet above the head of the bearer, with a coronal of flowers atop, and four long garlands hanging down, each held by a morris dancer. Then came the May Queen's gentleman usher, a fantastic personage in habiliments of blue guarded with white, and holding a long willow wand in his hand. After the usher came the main troop of Morris dancers, the men attired in a graceful costume, which set off their light active figures to advantage, consisting of a slashed jerkin of black and white velvet, with cut sleeves left open so as to reveal the snowy shirt beneath, white hose, and shoes of black Spanish leather with large roses. Ribbons were everywhere in their dresses, ribbons and tinsel adorned their caps, ribbons crossed their hose, and ribbons were tied round their arms. In either hand they held a long white handkerchief knotted with ribbons. The female Morris dancers were habited in white, decorated like the dresses of the men. They had ribbons and wreaths of flowers round their heads, bows in their hair, and in their hands long white knotted kerchiefs. In the rear of the performers in the pageant came the rush-cart, drawn by a team of eight stout horses, with their manes and tails tied with ribbons, their collars fringed with red and yellow worsted, and hung with bells, which jingled blithely at every movement, and their heads decked with flowers. The cart itself consisted of an enormous pile of rushes, banded and twisted together, rising to a considerable height, and terminated in a sharp ridge, like the point of a Gothic window. The sides and top were decorated with flowers and ribbons, and there were eaves in front and at the back and on the space within them, which was covered with white paper, were strings of gaudy flowers embedded in moss, 
amongst which were suspended all the ornaments and finery that could be collected for the occasion, to wit flagons of silver, spoons, ladles, chains, watches, and bracelets, so as to make a brave and resplendent show. The wonder was how articles of so much value would be trusted forth on such an occasion, but nothing was ever lost. On the top of the rush-cart, and bestriding its sharp ridges, sat half a dozen men, habited somewhat like the Morris dancers, in garments bedecked with tinsel and ribbons, holding garlands formed by hoops decorated with flowers, and attached to poles ornamented with silver paper, cut into various figures and devices, and diminishing gradually in size as they rose to a point, where they were crowned with wreaths of daffodils. A large crowd of rustics of all ages accompanied the Morris dancers and rush-cart. This gay troop having come to a halt as described before the cottage, the gentleman usher entered it, and tapping against the inner door with his wand, took off his cap as soon as it was opened, and bowing deferentially to the ground, said he was come to invite the Queen of May to join the pageant, and that it only awaited her presence to proceed to the green. Having delivered this speech in as good set phrase as he could command, and being the parish clerk and schoolmaster to boot, Samson Harrop by name, he was somewhat more polished than the rest of the hinds, and having moreover received a gracious response from the May Queen, who condescendingly replied that she was quite ready to accompany him, he took her hand, and led her ceremoniously to the door, whither they were followed by the others. Loud was the shout that greeted Alison's appearance, and tremendous was the pushing to obtain a sight of her, and so much was she abashed by the enthusiastic greeting, which was wholly unexpected on her part, that she would have drawn back again if it had been possible. But the usher led her forward, and Robin Hood and the foresters, having bent the knee before her, the hobby-horse began to covet anew among the spectators, and tread on their toes, the fool to wrap their knuckles with his bauble, the piper to play, the taborer to beat his tambourine, and the Morris dancers to toss their kerchiefs over their heads. Thus, the pageant being put in motion, the rush-cart began to roll on, its horses' bells jingling merrily, and the spectators cheering lustily. End of chapter 1